So our first speaker for our conference um, is Nadia Odawayo, who has come all the way from London. She's also managed to bring with her her fantastic parents, Lara and Wale, who are sitting in the front here. Can you give them a warm welcome as well, Woo! please? Nadia told me that her mum would love that I did that and her dad would hate it. Is that, is that just going to check out? <laughs> yeah, they agree. <laughs> 50% success rate. Yeah. So... Nadia, again, didn't sort of, almost didn't end up as a, as a software engineer. She started studying at Oxford University, which is amazing because the whole UK is just pretty cool. Um, <laughs> our animals are better, though. Uh, <laughs> and she actually studied philosophy, politics, and economics with the idea of becoming an investment banker. Uh, and then did an internship and realised she did not want to become an investment banker. Uh, and ended up get, winning a competition to attend a boot camp, the uh, Makers Academy. I'm getting, yes. Oh, I have my notes, but they're gone. Uh, and so after that, she worked for quite a few um, different companies. She worked for Pivotal and Cloud Foundry. And since then, she's been working on a whole bunch of different projects of her own. Um, she's been involved with SpeakerLine, which is a project about, all about demystifying the CFP process. She's worked on the Ruby Books Club podcast, which is available online and really worth a listen. Um, she worked as CTO of Code Newbies, which is you know, a podcast and general community, uh, which which has been super amazing, it was super inspiring for me when I was going through my newbie coder journey and learning to become a dev. Um, she's also an amazing hip hop dancer, apparently her Instagram is full of it and uh, <laughs> just dancing everywhere and everyone's like, but what, I thought you were a developer, how can you do these things as well? Dancing um, and developing at the so same time. So talented, so busy. Um, she was co-founder and director at Ignition Works. She's done so many things. I'm exhausted just describing her, so I'm going to let her do the talking now. Can you please give a very warm welcome to Nadia Odawayo? Okay, hi everyone. So I've got a question for you. Do you have a side gig? You know, something that brings in a little extra each month. I do. At the time of the story I'm going to tell you today, I was a product manager for a software team at a bank. But by night, I'm a private investigator. And what is it I investigate? Ruby crimes. No, not dual theft, the programming language. And why did I decide to go into private investigating? Well, there's been rumors of a shady mastermind causing havoc and confusion amongst Ruby developers worldwide with his constant meddling in the source code. And I wanted to help put a stop to it. So I decided that I couldn't do this job under my normal name. I needed to protect my identity. And so I chose the name Deirdre Bug, D for short. And why did I choose this name? Well, only for the sole purpose of making this joke. <laughs> and today I want to tell you about one of my more memorable cases, the case of the missing method. Chapter one. So I'm sitting alone, bored in my flat, when the doorbell rings. And it's Mike, and he didn't look too happy. Let me tell you a bit more about Mike. He was an acquaintance of mine. We had some mutual friends, saw each other now and again. He was 24 years old, a junior Ruby developer, and he got excited about test-driven development. And he'd been applying for an apprenticeship at the prestigious Ruby Institute of Professionals. And he'd managed to go through all of the stages beating hundreds of applicants to the final stage, and it was happening in two days. And there were two people left fighting for the final spot, himself and a woman named Jenny. So Jenny was 27 years old, also a junior Ruby developer, and she loved all things Rails. She's also Mike's best friend and housemate, and they had quit their consulting jobs together to enter into the world of tech, and not long after also decided to live together. And for the interview, they'd agreed to work together to prepare so that they each had the best shot. May the best person win, they said. 
So they'd been asked to research a series of topics that they were going to be grilled on. And one of them was method lookup. And they'd assigned this topic to Jenny. And this was the reason that Mike had come to me. Something doesn't add up in Jenny's notes, he said. But Jenny's been so stressed and panicked, rather uncharacteristically, by this interview that she won't hear me out, he continued. So she's convinced that she's right, and she says that they don't have time for Mike's doubts. And Mike tells me that if I can help him find the answer to this mystery, he'll have what he needs to confidently correct Jenny's notes and save them from interview failure. So he reaches into the satchel that he's brought with him and he draws out some sheets of paper. And they're Jenny's supposedly flawed notes. So I ask him to walk me through them. So Jenny's got these boxes to represent the concept of a ruby object. And all objects have a label called class. And this acts as a reference to the parent class of the object in question. Some objects are instance objects. And the class label for them refers to another type of ruby object, a type class. All objects of type class also have their own class label. And they also have a methods label, which points to a table of all methods that instances of that class can call. And then Jenny's written, any class you define is an instance of a class object called class. So if we were to write class cake in our code, we're creating a class object named cake. It's an instance of another class object, and the name of that object is class. So all classes are of type class with a capital C. And then she had this code in her notes. So class cake, and there were two methods, an instance method called tasty, which returned true if the flavor of the cake was carrot. So I knew that Jenny was a smart person. <laughs> and then there was a class method called edible, which always returned true. And then she said, imagine if we had a cake instance called carrot. So carrot equals cake.new. Then this is what the method lookup chain would look like. We'd have a carrot object. It would have a class label. That would point to a cake object, which would also have a class label. It would also have a methods label that would point to a table which had the entry tasty, because all instances of cake can call tasty. And the class label for cake would point to a Ruby object called class. It would have a methods label, and that would point to a table which, which had the entry edible. And then Jenny had written, a method definition always comes from an objects class. And at this point, Mike shook his head with frustration. He said, it cannot be that the edible method lives on the parent class for all classes. Can I show you something, he asks me. Can I, can I jump into your computer? So I say, OK. So he goes over to my desk. He opens up a terminal, enters Pry, and loads in the cake class from Jenny's notes. So the first thing he does is show that the class of cake is indeed class. And then he searches the instance methods of class for edible. False. What a mystery. So I'm stumped. I'm not sure how to proceed with this one. But D does love a challenge. And if anyone can do it, D can. And this meant a lot to Mike. He was prepared to pay me handsomely. And so I agreed to take on the case. Chapter two. Ever heard of Google? <laughs> or if you care about people like me not spying on you, maybe you go for DuckDuckGo. Well, when I'm D, I don't believe in these tools. I don't trust them. And so it's no coincidence that with this approach, I've become the best Ruby PI the industry has to offer. But what did I have? Books. Books, books, and more books. And I spent a whole day quickly skimming a load of books, but I couldn't find anything useful. So I thought, OK, why don't I form a hypothesis and go from there? So I said, the edible method, while not in cake, must be somewhere in the ancestry tree. So what's the ancestry tree? Well, it shows all of the classes and modules that a class inherits from, so all the possible places that methods could come from. And I thought, OK, why don't I create a method to help me search this ancestry tree? So I created this method called where, and it took two parameters, an object and the method that I'm looking for. And it looks through all of the ancestors of an object's class to try and find the class where the instance methods of that class, and only that class, 
included the method that we're looking for. So I thought, let's give it a go. So I wanted to check it was working. So I created an instance of cake, and I wanted to find the tasty method in relation to that instance. Great, it's on cake. And now it was the moment of truth. Where was edible hiding? What? Nowhere <laughs> at all. What a mystery. So at this point, I'm confused. And I think, OK, time for some fresh air, a change of scenery. And so I decide to head to my favorite co-working space. And here, I feel at home. I'm surrounded by people hacking away, and I quickly settle down at a desk. But given my naturally inquisitive nature, my eyes couldn't help but stray to the screen of the guy next to me. And he was an IRB, and he was playing around with something called object space. I thought it looked interesting, and so I asked him, what's that? And he said, well, it's a way that you can interact with all of the live objects within a Ruby session. So if you were to type this, object space count objects and pass in the symbol T class into IRB, then you could see all the live class objects that you have in a Ruby session. So I thought, I've been working hard, time for a break, why don't I have a little play? So I went into IRB and I counted all the live class objects. 936, so I said, okay, let me create a class and see that that number goes up to 937. 938, that's strange. Um, let me try that again. Nine hundred and forty. What? What a mystery. <laughs> but I couldn't spend too long thinking about this because just then the phone rang, and it was my friend wondering where I was. I'd completely forgotten that I'd agreed to go to a tech lecture with her. I was anxious that I didn't really have much time to solve Mike's case, but I'd been cancelling a lot on this friend lately, putting my PI duties first. So I thought, okay, on this occasion, I'm going to make a bit of time for her, and I rushed out of the door. Chapter three. So I remember I turned up just in time for the start of this lecture. And it was about a language called small talk. I didn't really care about it. After all, I only have space in my heart for Ruby. But, you know, I listened. I was there for my friend after all. So the lecturer said, okay, small talk was created in 1970 and it led to the birth of object-oriented programming. But I couldn't concentrate for much longer. I couldn't stop thinking about my play with object space. Each time I created one new class, and yet two new objects were being created. Psst, pay attention, my friend said. So I looked up and I saw the lecturer asking the room, well, what is a class of a class in small talk? And she had this code on the screen I hadn't quite been following, but she had this polygon object, and she'd asked the system, well, what's the class of polygon? It had returned polygon class. And then she asked the system, well, what is the class of polygon class? And it returned meta class. So the lecture reiterated the class of a class in Smalltalk is called a meta class. And in fact, all languages that Smalltalk has inspired have their own concept of meta classes. And this includes Objective C, Java, Python, and Ruby. Something clicked. One class, two objects. And so I made my apologies to my soon to be no longer friend, and I rushed out of the door home. I thought I'd try my luck, but of course that would be too easy. So I said, okay, let me see all the methods that exist on cake. And I found this list pretty overwhelming. And so I said, okay, let me look at all the methods on cake that contain the word class. Right, so this was a lot more manageable and two methods stuck out for me. One was superclass, and the other one was singleton class. So the first thing I thought to do was to remind myself of the ancestry tree for cake. So I knew that the edible method didn't live in any of these places. So let's see what superclass returns. Object, not what I'm looking for. It's in the cake class's ancestry tree. So let's try the other one, singleton class. Ooh, this was different. Not seen this before. And when I looked at the ancestry tree of the cake singleton class, 
I saw three new objects that I'd not seen before. Very interesting. So I thought, let me go back to my where method. And rather than searching for the ancestors of an objects class, let me instead look through the ancestors of the objects singleton class so that I could look through those new objects that I just discovered. And then it was time to give it a go. Result. And I thought, let me just check that what I think is happening is actually happening. And in my excitement, I forgot how to type, but I got there eventually, and I confirmed that the edible method lived on the cake singleton class. Case closed. Chapter four. So at this point, I'm super delighted. I'm very excited to share the news with Mike. I also took a moment to think, you know, maybe I should retire because this would prove to be one of the biggest successes of my career. And they always say that you should quit while you're ahead. Anyway, I gave Mike a call. Uh, I say, can I come round? I've solved the case. He's like, brilliant, of course, come round. I'll get the notes ready and waiting for you. But although I'd solved the case for Mike, I wasn't satisfied. I just discovered a whole new concept in the language that I hadn't heard of before. What are singleton classes? So instead of going directly to Mike's, I decided to take a detour to visit a friend of mine. Her name was Ellen. She was 43, a freelance developer who regularly contributed to the Ruby language code base. And I proceed to tell Ellen all about the case. And when I'm done, I ask her, so singleton classes, what are they? She says, well, they're hidden classes created internally behind the scenes in Ruby. They're there to hold methods defined for only one particular object. So take your instance caret of the cake class. Its singleton class would hold methods specific only to caret and not to another instance, say if you had one called red velvet or chocolate. So I said, OK, given they're working away behind the scenes, when does knowing about them become useful? So she thought for a while. And then she told me about one of her recent clients. And they were called Budgeting Inc. And they were creating a clever artificial intelligence, machine learning, personal finance tool for small business owners. And they were expanding globally. And they needed to roll out slightly unique versions of their software for each new city that they entered. So Ellen told me that when she first looked at the code base, she was horrified, because different Developers had been responsible for each new city, and it looked like there was a new approach for each one. And this meant that there was a lot of duplication. And sometimes it was very obvious where things had been copied, and sometimes it was less obvious. But this meant that there was a lot of wasted time on development, because the, the developers were often reinventing the wheel and often doing a bad job of it. And so there were a lot of bugs. Some things had been copied, some things had been left out, and it was difficult to see what was important. So the developers were unhappy. They had a lot of ties and work. The cognitive load was high. And the product owner was also unhappy because delivery was either very slow, all things were spun out quickly, and they were bug ridden, so stuff was missed out. Ellen wasn't quite sure what to do. And then she thought, well, why don't I create a DSL, a domain-specific language? She asked me if I knew what she was talking about. I said, it's a mystery to me, Ellen. You're going to have to explain. So she, she beckoned me over to her computer and said, let me demonstrate a basic version of a DSL to you. So she opened up a price session and input this class. It was called city instance. It had a class method called construct, which took a block. Then there was a variable called city, which called out to initialize via the new keyword. Then we called instance eval passing in the block on the city. And Ellen said, pay attention to this line because it's going to become important later. And then we return city. We have an attribute reader called taxes, initialize method, uh, which sets up the instance variable taxes as an empty array. And we have a method called tax, which takes an argument name, and we push that tax into the taxes collection. So Ellen said, let's give it a go. So she created a city called New York, added a couple of taxes. and then printed out the taxes. 
And there we have it, said Ellen. This is a very simple DSL, and we can quickly spin up these lightweight city objects. And then she said, well, imagine if we had other properties, so not just taxes. We had maybe a list of banks or a list of different finance schemes that you can find in each city. Or imagine if we had more information about each of these properties. So maybe the taxes also have information about the rates and the thresholds. So using this simple framework, it's not hard to extend the city instance class to create incrementally more complex city objects. Well, imagine taking that to the next level, said Ellen. Imagine interacting with this city instance class in the same way on the command line, but instead of just creating variables in our price session, in fact, we're spinning up subclasses of city and other related models for each tax, scheme, or bank that you list. So she explains how this was the sort of thing that she ended up developing for Budgeting Inc., a DSL which allowed for quick and easy scaffolding of each new city subclass and any related classes. So now we know how to spin up identical city instances with different names and different taxes, said Ellen. What about if one city had a quirk? So she said, OK, think of a place in the UK. So I thought about it, and I chose Bath, because that was the scene of my first case. So she said, OK, let's create Bath. Let's add a tax. And then she said, think of something that makes people in the UK really unhappy. <laughs> and she didn't like my suggestion. She thought it was <laughs> controversial. And so she said, let's just focus on the fact that it rains all the time. And when it rains, the government clears everybody's taxes because they feel sorry for everyone. <laughs> Great. So we have Bath. We see their taxes. And it rains. And so they call a rainy day amnesty. Now there's no more taxes. But remember our friends in New York, said Ellen. Well, they've heard about this rainy day amnesty that's in Bath, and they want it too. And so it rains, and they decide to call a rainy day amnesty. But it doesn't work. Undefined method rainy day amnesty for city instance. And then there were all these characters. And Ellen said, do you know what these characters are? Well, let me show you something. And she calls singleton class on New York. And I can see that it's the same object. So, Ellen said, when we enter the realm of DSLs, calling methods like instance eval, we're leveraging the existence of singleton classes. Because what instance eval does is it stores any method declarations passed in via the block onto an object singleton class. Hold on to that thought, though, said Ellen. She said, I want to take a step back to the high level for just a moment. So she said that creating a DSL like this enabled the developers to spin up each new city instance effortlessly. So she managed to abstract out all of the key similarities between any city. So developers had a frictionless way via the command line of spinning up the foundation that they needed. And the code base was better maintained because all of the scaffolding had been well tested once by Ellen. So none of the, none of the developers had to worry about it. They could now focus on the interesting bits, which was the customization required for each new city. So the scope was much more refined. So now, the developers were happy because interacting with this system was a joy, and it was easier to have a high-level overview of the whole domain in their head, purely just by looking at the documentation for the DSL. And the product owner was delighted also because there were far fewer bugs, delivery was faster, and she could also speak in the same language that the developers were by expressing new requirements with using the terminology of the DSL. But let's go back to singleton classes, said Ellen. Why is knowing about them useful? Well, one of the main reasons I was able to complete this project to a high standard was because I understood exactly where I was defining methods at any given time. Because once you enter the realm of dynamically creating classes and methods on singletons, the class hierarchy and method lookup gets far more interesting. And you might be getting error messages that you can't make head or tail of. And you need to be able to spot when singleton classes might be involved and where they're hiding, because it could save you from a lot of headache. But beware, said Ellen. So I've been going on about DSLs, but they're not the answer to everything. Perhaps you have some complex repeated business rules, and you need to customize behavior in some specific cases. Then you can consider DSLs. But even then, approach them with caution. But, said Ellen, you don't need to be writing DSLs for it to be beneficial for you to understand how they work. 
So are you using Rails? Well, if so, you see DSLs every single day. So she went over to her computer and she went on the Rails Guide's website and said, active record migrations, they are carried out via a DSL. When you specify how your table behaves using things like create table, t.string, that's a DSL. When you specify how your Rails app handles HTTP requests, that's also done via DSL. And I'd just been doing this stuff by rote. I didn't stop to think about what was happening behind the scenes every time I typed in the resources keyword into my config roots RB file? And there's more of these, said Ellen. And so she said that when people talk about Rails magic, it's not really magic. It's more just a collection of well-written DSLs. And then Ellen said, I hope you're TDD all of the time. And I said, of course, what do you take me for? And she said, <laughs> well, our spec with its described context and it blocks, those are all DSLs. And so, with all of these Rails and RSpec DSLs, knowing about singleton classes can help. Because you might find yourself in a tricky situation, and you can't make head or tail of it, you spent a long time, and this is particularly the case if you inherit a code base. And so, if you're seeing a funny bug to do with methods, you never know. Singleton classes might be the answer. And having them as part of your suite of debugging tools is useful. So I was feeling super leveled up by the end of this conversation. And armed with this new knowledge, I headed over to Mike's. But when I arrived, I found a Mike who had tears in his eyes. He'd obviously been recently crying. And he had crumpled pieces of paper in his hand. And he, he raised his arm towards me, offering me the papers. And they looked exactly the same as the method lookup notes of Jenny's that he brought to me the other day. So I took the notes from him. I looked through them, but I couldn't see what was wrong. They looked exactly the same. So there was the carrot object with its class label, pointing to the cake object, which had its class label and its methods label, and the table with tasty in it. And then there was the class object with its methods label, and that had the edible entry in there. But wait, it, it didn't say class like last time. This time, it said cake singleton. And as Mike saw me notice this difference, he fell to his knees and broke down in tears. Jenny knew about singleton classes all along, he cried. He'd gone into her room to find the notes in advance of my arrival, and this was the copy he had found. Turns out Jenny was so desperate to secure the job for herself that he set out to intentionally mislead Mike in the hope that he would fail a whole section of the interview and therefore look underprepared. I was disappointed in myself because I had been so focused on the main villain, the shady mastermind, that I'd failed to spot a villain right under my nose. My best friend tried to sabotage me, Mike cried, and he started wailing and he was saying, I'm not gonna go to the RIP interview tomorrow. And I said, nonsense, you cannot give up now. I crouched down next to him. I gave him a comforting pat on the shoulder and I said, you can do this. And I have just the thing to set you apart from Jenny. And he looked up hopeful. Have you heard of DSLs? I asked him. And I proceeded to tell him everything that Ellen had just shared with me. And although Mike still looked devastated as I left him, I had confidence that I had inspired him with the power of singleton classes, that he'd pull himself together and go and secure that RIP internship for himself. So two months later, I managed to drag myself to a Ruby hack night. And I arrive, I'm milling about, enjoying the free food and drink, when I hear a couple of people whispering in the corner. Ooh, she's really famous, one of them says. And I look across the room, and who do I see? Ellen. So I walk over, we catch up, and I tell her I've been reflecting on the case of the missing methods and my takeaways. So we've got singleton classes, they're there to hold methods to find for one particular object. And that when you understand them, it opens up a whole new world of Ruby, dynamically creating classes and methods on the fly in more complex applications using things like DSLs. But, I said, I still feel as if day to day I can get by ignoring them. So do I really have to care about them at all? Not really, said Ellen. I mean, like you say, if you're using DSLs, it's a good idea. And they do underpin popular frameworks like Rails, but day to day, you can get by. However, she said, understanding why singletons are there, I think, is super interesting and empowering. 
Think of the Ruby core team. They wanted to keep things as straightforward and simple as possible. And by simple, I mean, how can we minimize special cases and aim for having one way or one pattern for explaining how anything works? They asked themselves, how consistent can we get things? And so what's consistent in the realm of Ruby methods? Well, if you think about it, all methods in Ruby are defined in only one of two places, a normal class object or a singleton class. And every method in Ruby is really an instance method. And method lookup always starts with a singleton class. So class methods don't have any fundamentally different behavior. What we call class methods are really instance methods where the object in question is a class and the method is stored on the class as singleton. So yeah, singleton classes are invisible, yet they're everywhere. They're a fundamental part to how Ruby and its method lookup works. So I left the hack night deep in thought. Ellen had inspired me to explore more of Ruby behind the scenes. There was so much here that I didn't know, that I'd only scratched the surface. And I'd always been a general Ruby PI, and, and I'd been very successful in the field, but perhaps it was time to find a niche to reach that next level. Thank you so much, Nadia. That was so great, so informative. I love a well-written narrative. That was really amazing. There was so many great stories in that and so many great technical things as well that I need to go home and open up my IRB and just be like, I need to test this. And I hope no friendships break over Ruby today. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing we forgot to mention at the start is that the air con, if you've noticed the room is a little warm, it was broken this morning. They're working on fixing it. They think it was a software fault. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Hands up if you are a software developer. <laughs> it wasn't us. Yeah. Um, it, it feels a little cooler now, so it might be fixed. If not, they'll be on it soon. Uh, we're running a little behind since we did take quite a while to get everyone through registration this morning. Um, we will be cutting about 10 minutes off lunch, uh, which means we've probably got until about 10 past 11 for morning tea. So please, once you've had a bite to eat, if it's getting close to that time, do start moving back in. Uh, I think we'll have some volunteers kind of herding you back in again towards yeah. the end of the break too. So cool. It's been a great morning. Um, let's get some coffee and then be back here 10 past 11. See you soon. See you soon. <laughs>